Hi everybody, welcome to our episode of A Piece of Ash. This is my monthly show, late this month, I know, um, where you guys can ask me questions about the world of wargaming, what's going on in the co-op, what's going on with the channel, what's going on with me, uh, and I will answer to the best of my ability. Now, um, this episode is late by week, uh, and that's because I have been at home. Um, I had my, um, my wife had a uh, minor surgery and couldn't lift up our kids for like two and a half weeks. Uh, and so I haven't been to the studio in two and a half weeks. I've just been running down the con. This is why when you guys first, when I first started this and you guys asked me, um, why haven't you posted stuff for a month? I said, I'm building up a month's worth of content so that I, if something ever happens, I keep releasing content and it's not interrupted and I can take the time off that I need. So this is one of those situations where I took the time off I needed um, to help out with the kids because they, if she can't lift anything just because of the nature of her surgery, um, it meant that, um, that I was there to, to look after them and she was able to just convalesce and I could take care of her too. So I haven't been to the studio until for a full day filming actually until today. This week was the first week back. Um, I was able to go and film some stuff with Owen. You guys saw the Human Sphere and 3 game we filmed. Uh, and now I'm back today uh, filming games and I was able to actually catch up and do this piece of ash and on the paint table that you guys would have seen last weekend too. Um, so uh, I usually hobby while we do this. Uh, you guys get to ask me questions on SurveyMonkey. Now if you want to get in your question for the June show, because this is the May show, go click the link below in the video description um, and get it in fast because they do answer these in chronological order. So if I don't get to your question from this month, uh, you guys will get it as fast as possible for next month and then I'll hopefully answer it then. Uh, now I am working on some stuff today. I'm working on some Keltar specialists for Infinity. Um, I'm going to be featuring Toha a lot uh, this time around in um, ITS 2016 and in 2016 because I promised I would start and sort of like work on a new army. Uh, I'm also um, building some, if I get to them, if I have time, some Dark Age guys. I've got some St. Mary stuff I want to get done too. And this will go into the project pile. Now the, the Keltar specialists probably won't get painted right away. I have a chunk of um, Toha stuff that needs to get painted first. But once they're done, they'll start getting painted and I'm gonna bring them in because Fairwear is a new interesting three in, in Human Sphere and 3 and I wanna show it to you guys. So let's jump in, start asking questions. I'm gonna work on these guys and we'll move along. Medicus asks, you're on holiday and you have the choice of four hotels, each run by one of the different four chaos gods. Which hotel do you stay in and why? Keep the great work. <laughs> well, that's easy. I'd stay in Slanesh's hotel. I don't get my head chopped off. I don't get sick. I feel like the Zinch one might be okay. It'd probably be like a big library or like a bunch of games of chance that like you never actually ever win. It'd be like some weird Twilight Zone episode where all the games of chance are rigged against you and people throw ducks at balloons and nothing's as it seems. Um, but yeah, no, I would I would probably go to Slanish's. And even though I'm a married guy, there's pretty obvious reasons. I I tried it once. <laughs> There's my answer. Uh, Gunbird asks, what is your favorite quirky thing that's happened to you in a, this is not a test game so far, probably my complete inability to, to use power armor in any way, shape, or form. Like, that game I played with Jay with the Gallus Gallus and Boom Gallus, and he just killed Mr. Pink Pilkington with the missile launcher. You guys don't watch, it's not a spoiler, like, that game's been aired. It's, that's old news now, he just died. And then Mr. Whimper on the other flank, his first activation test of the first turn, he breaks his power armor, and then he breaks his gun, and he literally just stands around fixing his gun and fixing his power armor for most of the game. I don't know why, I, but I think I, that's one of the things I love about this not test, is it's kind of self-balancing in a way. You can make this awesome, tough guy, but it, chances, like, there's, an, it's entirely possible that he just won't do anything for you all game, because his crap just breaks down. And so, like, the best tech, like, the best stuff you can take in the game is also prone to failure, and that kind of balances out the fact that it's amazing and really good in the game, and, you know... It can, it can change the way the game goes uh, based on how good it is. You don't have to worry about that because if you're like me and you get bad dice, it don't matter. <laughs> it, just, it just sucks. Um, yeah, so, so that, that would be one of my favorite things is that every time I think I'm playing real good, I just think, Joey reminds me, I wrote a game where you can't just game it because stuff can just go wrong for you because you live in the wasteland and your stuff's broke. Mm, Crown Blade asks, will we see you play Blood Eagle? I've heard that name before. I honestly can't put my, my name to it right now. I know Blood Rage is the risk with Vikings that had like really cool game components that Cool Mini did. Uh, I'm thinking of Arena Rex, I think, which is the other one with Romans where it's like gladiatorial. I don't remember Blood Eagle, dude. I'll look into it. I mean, I'll play anything. I'll try anything. Um, if, you, if you really want me to play it, get in touch with them and tell them about me because that's usually the best way for me to do it because there's so much going on that like... Yeah, <laughs> that's usually a good way of doing it. 
Um, who is the best commissar? Yerik, Gaunt, or Kyphus Kane here in the Imperium? Kyphus, Cyphus. I've heard it pronounced both ways, um, even by guys that work at Black Library, so I don't really know which way is the right way. I'm going to say Kyphus because it's more fun to say things with the hard C. Um, I think Kyphus, I, and I think if I was going to rank him, I'd go Yerik because he's just the archetypal one. You know what I mean? He's the unstoppable super commissar. And he's a classic. Uh, and then I would rank them Gaunt and then Kyphus. And I think it's by order of most interesting. I think the reason for that is I love absurdist comedy. Um, and <sighs> Kyphus Kane's novels are, are classic absurdism. They, they allow the reader to look at the 40K universe and the Imperium in general through the eyes of, of us today, right? So Kyphus, he, he represents us right now today trapped in 40K. Because his sentimentality, his morals, are all our sentimentality and morals. He just looks at the 40K universe and goes, what is going on? You don't have to pray to the computer before you turn it on. <sighs> I love that he calls them, he calls on the Ecclesiarchy guys emperor botherers. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. But it just makes me happy. But yeah, no, I think, I think that's, I think it's a great bit of writing in that he allows us to view the 40K, um, the 40k universe without sort of like the Imperium goggles, you know what I mean? That make it go, make you go, oh yeah, it's all real, it's all true. No, he just goes, he looks and goes, the Emperor's not wearing any clothes, man. It's Weekend at Bernie's, that guy's dead. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's my choice if I was gonna write them. Uh, Zarfe, I never get this right. Zarfe, Charfe, I don't know, Angle. Uh, he asks, since you watch a lot of movies, what are your thoughts on Creed? I actually never got to see Creed. I, I, I always, every year, my wife and I, one of our things that we like to do is go through all of the movies that are nominated by Oscars and try and see them before the Oscars happen. Whoops. Just so we have opinions. Like, I don't, I don't like watching, because I, I actually really enjoy the Oscars. Like, as much as people say, it's political and it's, you know, it's not real and it's not really what best, the best movie doesn't really win best movie. Um, you know, like uh, the whole thing with, I, cause I love Fury Road. I was really, I, I love how much Fury Road cleaned up at the Oscars. I wish it won best picture, but you know, like it didn't. And I understand why it didn't. It wasn't a movie everyone went and saw. Uh, it did, it did by its very just nature of its, of what it was, um, preclude some people going and seeing it. Didn't make it not a great movie. Uh, but yeah, but like, I enjoy the Oscars. I enjoy, because I enjoy film. So I kind of enjoy the idea of anything that makes us sit down and discuss it and its cultural relevance and, and the technical part of how it's made and all that stuff, um, how it's written. Like I just, I, I love anything that prompts that kind of informed discussion. And there's very few things in the world right now that lots of people take part in that make you have an intellectual conversation. Like it, you might have a statistical conversation about the Super Bowl, but it might not be an intellectual one. You know what I mean? It doesn't go to as many places necessarily as something that's around the arts like the, like that does. Um, and so I'm kind of glad for the Oscars for that reason. Now I didn't see Creed, and just to make a short story long, we'll come back to that. Um, but I do really appreciate that it did win some stuff and then it got nominated because I think that, um, I think the great thing that that Stallone has has done in that movie, even not having seen it, but just having understood sort of what it is, is he's he's coming around full circle in his own life, and I feel like it's all very autobiographical, right? Like he he's making a movie that's about where he is currently in his life and the next generation, and sort of that idea of handing stuff off to the people that come next, and and I think there's some there's some real merit in that. And he wrote the first one about you know the idea of overcoming odds and 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 you know the dark horse, the the long odds guy in the race and and the value that he brings to the race in and of itself and sort of like that idea of self-belief he made a very inspirational movie which again i think was very autobiographical um and to tie it up like that with that sort of like passing of the torch idea i think is fantastic i think he did a great job and, and say what you will about him as an actor but like i think he has definitely contributed culturally with the idea of his movies like the fact that his movies are about they're they're about a message, you know what I mean? Like he has a personal sort of like belief in that message and he's made movies that are about that. So good for him. I think he deserved the recognition that he got in that movie. <laughs> Clarence is my baby daddy asks. <laughs> what? <laughs> Any general advice on uh, asking a girl out? I like someone at my work, but I don't know what to do. I like the job, so if I'm rejected, I'm worried that it will make the workplace awkward. awkward. What do I do? Ah, I'm just dear Sally this week. Um, you ask, it's that simple. You just ask. Uh, don't be weird about it. Like, don't just walk up to a girl you never talked to before and ask. But if it's something you talk to, that you have a relationship with, you know, even if it's just a working relationship, 
just ask, just be up front and go, hey, uh, do you want to go grab a bite to eat? It'd be cool to catch up and get to know each other a little bit better. And you ask him out and that's it. It's not high school. You're not going to ask him to go study. Just ask him to go see a movie outside work or go grab a bite to eat outside work and get to know them better. That's it. That's all you have to do. It's just be direct. Don't be, don't be weird. <laughs> And that's it. Um, and I think that people build that stuff up way too much in their heads. You don't need to think about this this much. If you like somebody and you want to spend more time with them and get to know them better and have them get to know you better, walk up to them and ask. And the worst thing in the world's going to happen is they're going to say no. And the only reason it would be awkward is if you make it awkward. Just be like, okay, cool. And then leave. And that's it. It's done. There's nothing more awkward than that. Right? You can still have a great relationship with somebody at work that you've asked out after you've asked them out if you just don't take it too seriously because it's not a serious thing. It's just something you do. Ty asks, what are your thoughts on the Solar Auxilia uh, and other non-Marine armies in 30k? Do you want to see more of them or do you prefer just Marine on Marine combat? Um, I, what I love about those armies is that they all fit the period and what's going on. And they provide something different than their like regular 40k counterparts. So do I want to see more of them? Not necessarily. Um, I want to see more that that add more to this setting. Like I love, I love the Imperial Cults one. Like that one that Peter brought in, if you guys haven't watched it, I think go four games back right now in my M31 playlist uh, and check out the army that Peter Carlton, uh, or Carlson brought in. Um, and it's a uh, Imperial Cults uh, and Militia Army and it's just gorgeous. Like it's all converted, it's all ground pounders. It was so much fun to see what a Space Marine Legion does fighting that kind of army because it was very different from all the other Marine on Marine games that we've been playing. Um, and I thought that was super refreshing. I think that does add a lot to the setting. I think they, especially if you get to take them as allies and stuff too, because um, there's other people than Space Marines in that setting. So why would they not be around? And, and I think that anything that just adds narratively to the game is awesome. So I'm, I'm down with it because for me, 30K is all about the, the wonderful story and setting. Um, and just expanding that more and providing you with more cool options is the best. I think that's that's the, the fun of doing it. CJ Phoenix asks, hey Ash, how awesome does that 30 year space marine look? Um, what mark armor do you like the most? Two questions in one. Well, I guess the first one's a statement. Uh, yeah, it does look awesome. And I actually have um, the old lead version of that. And I made a joke with somebody, I think it might've been Mike, uh, cousins from Epic Deck Studios that I said like I should paint my old crappy well, not crappy my old you know original lead one and you should paint your new hot plastic one uh, and we'll have a painting contest to who, who wore it better um, <laughs> that would be super fun but yeah no I have I actually have that miniature in lead I have the original Imperial Space Marine uh, from 30 years ago and I should paint him but uh, uh, that being said the question was what is my favorite mark of armor um, and I have to say Mark VI, and the reason for that is real simple. Mark VI is the Mark of Armor that the RTB01 box was, and I can just remember obsessing over every single one of those miniatures in that box, all 30 of them that were in the first box of Space Marines I ever built, and wanting each one to be perfect and just being completely obsessed with like how they looked. So yeah, no, Mark VI is definitely my favorite. I, I love Mark VI. Bear Puncher asks, if you could create your own custom guild for Guild Ball, what would it be and what role do you feel they would fill in the game? Easy, miners. My dad's a mining engineer and I spent tons of my formative years, um, uh, especially uh, summers, working in mining exploration. Uh, and I think a miners guild would be awesome. Um, and you could have so many different things. You could have them interact with terrain. Uh, you could have them pull things out of terrain. I think it'd be cool because the terrain, it's, you're always gonna have two obstacles on the table. And that means that there's two consistent terrain pieces. So you could write rules for the Miner's Guild that have them interact with terrain in a certain way, um, knowing that there's always going to be at least two types of X. Because you have to have at least four pieces of terrain when you play Guild Ball. It's four to seven, and two of the, half your terrain always has to be obstacles. And that means that um, you could have rules tied to terrain and never shortchange a guy by not having terrain present, you know what I mean? So there's some stuff you could definitely do there. Uh, yeah, so definitely, that would be the Miner's Guild and I would play them in a heartbeat, and it'd be awesome. Koshi482 asks, how do you deal with a company that does nothing for their customers? They have a great game in miniatures, but customer support is terrible. Well, that's a really personal question, man, because like how you react to bad customer service, there's only really one option, and that's to vote with your wallet. Because when you're talking about something where you are a customer, the reason that you are receiving service is because you are, you are basically trading remuneration for it. You're trading money for that service. And if you're not happy with your service, the best way to vote is with your wallet. Uh, and there's no half measures there. You don't vote with your wallet by going and buying stuff from an internet retailer. 
because a manufacturer makes the same margin off them as they do off anybody else. So if you buy it at all, you are now you're still supporting that company. The only people you're dicking by going to an online retailer, if you have it, is your local gaming store. Um, so don't think that like going online and not buying from the local retailer does anything to hurt the company. Um, the discounter pays the same amount for that product wholesale as anybody else buying it wholesale. Now, <clears throat> the um, the choice really is yours. Like, are you in or are you out? If you don't like them anymore because of the customer service you received, tell them so by not buying anything and not necessarily playing their game. Uh, you could also just, I guess, keep using those models to play another game. Like, I, it's really personal. Like, that's a, that's a really, like, I'd have to be really pissed off to not want to even look at those miniatures, especially if I painted them already. Like, I've got an emotional investment in that stuff. I'm not gonna not play that game anymore because the company, you know, had one bad experience. Um, and the other thing I'll say to rationalize it is a company is not its employees and an employee is not its company. Uh, and that means a lot of things. Now, a company is made up of people, but you can't take the actions of a single employee and you don't know necessarily what the reason for that bad customer service is. It could just be the people in the customer service department. And the only way that you then change that is by letting them know their customer service is bad. And you can't do that by silently voting with your wallet. So I think that you do that. You, you If you behave appropriately and you have an adult conversation about it, then it, it gets noticed and it either changes or it doesn't. And if it either changes or doesn't, then then you make a decision. But I wouldn't take any one case in isolation. Um, I'm pretty rational that way. If I had one bad customer service experience, I'd usually rack that up to one bad customer service experience with one bad customer service agent, not necessarily that they give bad customer service. And if you're waiting for a year for parts, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what that means. I don't know how many times you tried. And I think that your reaction is going to be proportional to however you feel um, you should react. So I, I can't necessarily give you advice on that because I'm not, I don't know all the steps that have gone into that, that interaction with that company. Um, but perspective wise, like I said, try contacting someone outside of customer service and telling them how your customer service experience is might be better than just going, I hate your game. I'm done. I'm out. Cause it doesn't sound like you want to be out. It sounds like you like the game. You like the models. It's just that you're struggling right now with a bad experience and you, you, you're not able to separate maybe that experience from the company itself. So try the things, and if, if, it's, if it's just bad, then, and you feel really bad about it, then Scorched Earth is really the only way that, other than trying to let them know, if you haven't done that already, um, that you can vote as you're voting with your wallet. <clears throat> do, 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 do. Devin asks, hey Ash, really love the Guild Ball videos you've been doing. Hope to see more of them and less Age of Sigmar stuff. Well, it's not a question, it's a comment. And I don't feel great with that comment because I would never, those two shows don't even share a day. So I wouldn't ever wish that other people that like something get less of it so that I can get more of it. I don't feel good about that. So you guys know. It's not a good way to, it's not a good way to get more Guild Ball videos. This is tell me to take something away from somebody else that they might like, or that I might like too. Yeah, don't do that, that's bad. Thomas P.S. Hey Ash, love your stuff. I'm uh, currently out of books after reading, uh, finishing Gotrek and Felix. What are some good books to read in any genre and setting? I'm, I'm currently reading The Beast Arises, uh, which is the new sort of 31K series from Black Library. And I'm kind of really enjoying that because it's got a very different tone than current 40K. It's set like right after the Horus Heresy. Uh, and I'm just on book one by Abnett, uh, but so far it's really interesting. And it kind of is giving some insight into the the governing bodies of 40k which i think is really neat uh, so there's that i'm also uh getting ready to read leviathan rises which is the first book in the uh what is it the expanse that tv show the expanse that series and i'm super excited about that because i love a good hard sci-fi novel and i love uh political drama and those two things are the expanse so that's going to be cool too. Um, I would check those out. If you want to read along with Ash, that's currently what's kind of sitting on my iPad and on my bookshelf. Trainaholic asks, hey Ash, what video game area would you like to see as a game table? Oh man, okay. So I've actually had this conversation before um, and actually Adam from Greenleaf did this sort of a while back and it's, I want to see the Mushroom Kingdom from Super Mario as a game table. I think that would be so cool. Um, but not just like the green, like not just like the, the, the floating platforms and stuff, 
but also like the crazy floating things like like the fact that there's like grass growing on those or like like a frost grape style table that way kind of like the end of um uh, that Tomb Raider reboot where you're fighting along the mountaintops and all the exploded like and kind of like semi-ruined uh, Buddhist temples are up there that kind of thing I think that'd be awesome it'd be so cool to see like <clears throat> a frost grave table that's all like magically exploded mountaintop chunks with like bits of castle but it's all floating I think that'd be cool as hell yeah so so yeah like a very kind of hard mushroom kingdom um, fantasy or sci-fi either way I think fantasy would be better um, yeah it would look cool as hell really really cool that'd be awesome Magnus Fandon asks, can you please play Dreadfleet in your channel? I got it, but never tried it. So seeing a Let's Play and then an actual game would be awesome. Keep up the good work. I don't think I do a Let's Play because it's not in production currently. It's a, it's a one and done um, board game. I'd probably do it on Throwback Thursday. I do have a copy assembled in Prime that I never actually got around to painting. Um, I think it's going to be kind of like Space Hulk and it'll be the kind of thing that I... Um, uh, we'll, we'll do kind of like off and on. So I'll get it all painted at some point. Uh, there's so much stuff with Throwback Thursday though that I want to get to. <sighs> and one of the problems is that certain games are so popular that people always want to come play them. So like you guys love Mordheim. Um, and that means that like so many people ask to come play Mordheim. I'm never going to be at a Mordheim games. Like I have Mordheim games forever. And one of the things I've had to start doing is scheduling when I record Mordheim to air a Mordheim episode every other week and then fill in the in-betweens with other dead miniature games because I have so many Mordheim games retort, like recorded, it's like not even funny, um, which is a great problem to have, uh, but it does mean that there's like an out of proportion amount of Mordheim just because you guys love it so much um, to the other game systems. And so I am working on other stuff. Uh, Jordan and I uh, are both actually working on more Epic stuff. We've had this idea of doing like a uh, Titan Legion game. After that last game of Epic, we really wanted to do something different and to do a Titan Legion on Titan Legion game actually isn't that many models because you're just painting Titans. It would be like painting like a War Machine army basically to play Epic with, um, which we think would be hella fun. So we've actually dug out some Titans and are, are, are basically planning and plotting on doing that. So you'll see that in the upcoming uh, weeks and months too. Um, but yeah, I, I will definitely get to Dreadfleet. It's on the list. I have everything I need to do it. It's just a matter of like when, you know, like it's, you've, you watch me on the painting table. I have projects for years. And so it, we will get there eventually. Um, Patrick asks, uh, as a recovering dwarf player, I'm wondering about your thoughts on Fire Slayers in Age of Sigmar. Well, that's interesting. Um, I know people had a very adverse reaction to them and I didn't. And maybe I'll start answering the question there as to why I think that is. I love... I love change. <laughs> and I think the reason for that is that I'm never caught up in, I'm, I'm, not a final, I'm not a finality person. I don't look at the Age of Sigmar as Games Workshop never ever going back to a setting. I mean, look at 30K. We talk about 30K all the time. It's over. We all know how that ended, right? Like Horus and the Emperor, they fight and the Emperor gets in the Golden Throne. Horus dies. That's it. That's how it ends. It's Titanic, the ship sinks but we love it going back and exploring that time and all the things that happened. There's nothing stopping Games Workshop from doing the exact same thing with the old world. The old world isn't over, we just know how it ends. Um, and it's the same with 40K. We know how 40K is gonna end. If, if you read any of the books, there's all kinds of people prognosticating how it ends. Tyrannids eat everything, it's done, it's over. We lost. <laughs> Even the Eldar can't change it. Nothing can change it. It's all gonna, we're all gonna die. Everyone's dead. They're all already dead. We're just exploring kind of what happens during that period. Um, and so I look at the Fire Slayers and I love the story of them because they look like Slayers, but they're not Slayers. And there's a really good reason for that. They worship Gotrick. Gotrick was Grimnir and the eternal champion's cycle of life that, that this cosmic universe is now conveying, this Michael Moorcock-esque eternal champions thing. Again, a great reference that they're playing off of. Um, Gotrick was Grimnir. The dwarf god was was Gotrick. And so they they're modeling themselves in his image. They're looking for his relics. It's a post-apocalyptic fantasy world. Uh, and as a big fan of of that genre, like I loved Dark Sun when I was a kid. So I, I grew up in the 90s. TSR was was the, the king of fantasy novels before they folded. Uh, and if you were a kid my age, you probably read ton. And I never played DD, but I read tons of the books in the settings that D&D was being made to, and Dark Sun was one of them. Again, why I love Dark Age um, is because uh, all the art and design for it was done by Brom, Gerald Brom, who did all the stuff for, uh, whatchamacallit, too, for um, 
uh, Dark Sun. And so this idea of like a post-apocalyptic fantasy setting, I just love it. I think it's great. Uh, Dark Sun, for those of you who don't know, is basically a fantasy world with a giant ecological disaster that is magic. Because the, the, the way that magic is used, it sucks the life from everything. And, and basically, um, these crazy, huge, like super powerful wizards destroy the planet through magic. They, they, they cast spells so powerful that it turns the entire planet into a huge desert wasteland. Um, it, it eats up metal. It just destroys everything in its path. Uh, and the world is basically not what it used to be. Everything is unrecognizable. The most dangerous thing on the planet is halflings which I think is amazing. They're these like ninja cannibals that file their teeth into points. Um, so it's this like upside down universe from every fantasy universe you've ever known. And I love that about the Far Slayers is, is, is there an upside down parody basically of what we think of as Slayers. So like, I, I really appreciate that. And because I don't have this like feeling of finality um, about the universe, like I'm, I'm a guy that will always you know, be, be aware that I can go back to the old world anytime I want and play games there and, and you know, go play more time and be in that setting and enjoy it. Um, uh, I'm very open to like the change and, and enjoying sort of what the Fire Slayers are and why they are the way they are. So, so yeah, that's my, that's my thought on them. Um, I might not be a popular opinion, but I'm just trying to give you some perspective as to why I feel that way. Like they didn't, it didn't, they don't ruin anything for me. They just add more. And, and that because I, I kind of really enjoy this cosmic fantasy and this post-apocalyptic fantasy world that GW is currently explaining to us, um, there's a real sense of like, of, of like, oh, I see what they did there to me with those guys where they all are trying to find Gotrick's, Grimnir, Gotrick, they're the same person because he's the eternal champion. Uh, they're trying to find his relics and like figure out where he's gone and stuff. Kakillian asks, as a huge fan of skirmish games with campaigns and warband improvement, which game is the most enjoyable campaign to you? Um, not counting Mordheim, Frostgrave, Necromunda, or this is not a task. So you're cutting those out, so I can't answer those. That's okay. Um, and I have to pick one. I'm gonna cut Blood Boy too, because it sounds like you don't want me to answer with like current popular um, uh, or you know classic popular game choices, that's fine. Uh, and Blood Bowl is the penultimate campaign sports game. If you've never played it before, it's fantastic. It will be coming back around soon, and you guys will get to check it out because uh, we've all seen the box from the Game of Trade show. Um, huh, campaign games that are awesome like that. Well, there's one I'm about to check out. I can't tell you how awesome it is yet because I haven't played it, uh, but it's called Otherworld Skirmish, and it is a uh, D&D style classic campaign game. Um, I bought the rule PDF and I printed it off. I haven't given it a try yet, but I'm gonna give that one a go. It looks neat. Other games like that that I've actually played? Hmm. I do have to say I really enjoyed the campaign system in Battlefleet Gothic, and it doesn't get talked about a lot. Most people only play Gothic as a one-off game, but it had a very good, robust crew building, making your ships better, getting refits uh, campaign system that people don't tend to talk about very much, but it was really good. That was a really enjoyable campaign system. Um, and if you've never played uh, Battlefleet Gothic before, and after you learn the rules and get comfortable with the game, you're wanting like a, a good reason to keep playing it, building your fleet, because it meant, it meant that like conserving your resources was a really big deal. Like you couldn't just let ships die. Cause like if a ship died, its crew is dead. <laughs> like that, that ship was gone. All those people, they died too. Like you didn't just survive a ship exploding in space. So it was a big setback to your fleet. Um, yeah, no, it, it certainly, it had a really robust system. I would recommend checking it out. If you've never played, um, if you're comfortable with the rules, um, but you've never played it. it, it was a really good, fun campaign system. BFG, had a really good system too. This Harris train has no brakes, <laughs> asks. I love that you guys have made a game out of the names. It's just, it's awesome. Um, as the hobby's a big part of your life, have you ever tried to or enjoyed the hobby alongside your significant other in the past? Or is the hobby, or is it that hobby that the women's don't, the women's is, don't just don't understand? That's, well, okay, so that's, the last statement is just not true. There are plenty of women in the hobby. Um, it, you don't, gender does not define what you like or don't like. So uh, whether or not your significant other does it and whether or not um, there's a specific gender only in this hobby are two totally separate things. I think that um, like in any relationship, 
you share time with your significant other. I do lots of time with my significant other while I hobby, and she does her hobby. Like she'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll watch shows, we'll, she'll read, we'll, um, she'll play a board game with me while I paint even. Like we'll pass board games back and forth on the iPad. Um, we'll, you know, watch movies, we'll uh, do all kinds of stuff. And so I, I think if, if what you mean by that is paint miniatures play games with you, then no, I don't share that with my significant other. But I do share my hobby with my significant other, and I do plenty of hobbying with her while she's there, while she does her hobbies and stuff too. Um, crafting, stuff like that as well. So I think that, um, yeah, I think that the, your second question, is it something that women don't understand, is, is just inaccurate because I think that gender has nothing to do with interests at all. Um, and the first half is, uh, if you did it together before your relationship, you might still do it now and whether or not your significant other has an interest in your hobby it is going to be different with every significant other and every hobby, right? Like, my wife has absolutely no desire to go backpacking with me, ever. She does not want to sleep on the side of a mountain. She does not want to go up Kilimanjaro. She has no desire to do that at all. She also has no desire to play with toy soldiers with me. That doesn't make either of those hobbies more or less for women. <laughs> It's just my wife doesn't want to do those things. Um, they're not interesting to her. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, that's sort of the extent of it. But you'll, I think, like, like, like anything, your mileage will vary and it'll be different based on your relationship and um, what your significant other likes. So that's it. That's, there's my thoughts on that. Uh, but do, do, do. Bro Thurster of Corn asks, uh, you had this big spiel about doing limited run GW, GMG products, but with pre-orders gated on reaching enough interest, you should check out Kickstarter. It's a website that does that. Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't use Kickstarter for that. Um, I'm not going to crowdfund that because all that does is give Kickstarter a bunch of money and it's not, uh, no, I'm not going to use Kickstarter. I'm not going to crowdfund those kinds of things. Um, but I will tell you, I have ordered a bunch of limited edition uh, GMG gauges, which may be available soon. So we'll talk about that later. Kilroy asks, which are better, synthetic or natural brushes? Which type and why? The horses for courses. Um, natural brushes have a use. Synthetic brushes also have a use. Um, typically, I like synthetic brushes for robust things like dry brushing. Um, anytime my brush is gonna get a lot of work doing something. So like synthetic brushes are great for painting terrain. Um, anytime you're scrubbing with them a lot, they're very durable. Um, there's another thing too with, uh, with brushes is the nature of the plug. So what, and when I say plug, it's the thing holding the bristles together inside, so it's, the plug is this. So here's the metallic end of the paintbrush. What's holding those bristles in there is the plug. Um, and what that's made from can change how brushes are too. So regardless of whether they're synthetic or if they're natural fibers, that plug can, can make your brush more or less robust. Uh, yeah, so uh, I don't think there's a better. I think it's just horses for courses. Um, I love natural brushes for fine detail work and points. You gotta take a lot more care of them. Their plugs can tend to be a little more um, I put a gent, um, uh, not brittle, subject to wear, so be careful with them, um, because the, the thing holding them together might be something that'll dissolve if you use like a coarse solvent to clean your brushes, uh, and synthetic brushes tend to be a lot more durable, and you use them for things that need durability in a brush, so it's, it's six of one, half dozen the other, you use them for what they're meant to be used for, so like anything else. The Kamikaze Watermelon asks, Hey Ash, I'm going to assemble an extras tank for my sister's battle. What are your tips for working with metal and getting it to hold? I find super glue alone does not cut it. Well, let me tell you, there's no fun way um, to do a, a plastic metal hybrid kit. There just really isn't. They are um, two completely like <laughs> different types of glue basically to get them to hold. And when you are trying to get them to get together, the only really surefire way of doing it um, is super glue and pinning. And it's not really a fun answer, but because it's a laborious answer, but if you can create some connection points for the bigger metal pieces um, that are pinned to the plastic pieces, that'll give you at least some reinforcement for the glue. Um, it is the one time too that I would consider using an accelerant like Zip Kicker. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's a cyanoacrylate uh, super glue a hardener basically it usually comes in a little spritz bottle you don't need to spritz it because that's just going to put carcinogens in the air all around you and those are bad <laughs> uh, what we usually do is just unscrew the top and just dab the little pipe that's that the spritzer's got going into it on the part you want to have um attach and then put glue on the other side and glue the two bits together and that'll speed up the joints so 
That's my tips for doing those. They are pain in the butt. I completely commiserate. I'm sorry that you have to go through that. <laughs> Heath asks, why do you lick your paintbrush? It's so funny. Um, I had this exact conversation with Chris from Mini Wargaming um, about licking my paintbrush because he doesn't do it. He doesn't understand why I do it. It's actually an age old and fine tradition that killed and made some of the uh, great masters of the Renaissance go mad because um, they, uh, they were using paints that were poisonous. They had toxic ingredients. Um, and so licking their paintbrush, which was typically just done to put a point on it because uh, your saliva acts as a great medium um, and the act of licking your paintbrush pulls all the bristles together in a nice fine point. Um, is something that artists have done for literally hundreds and thousands of years. So <clears throat> I do it to put a point on my brush uh, and sometimes even just to add some of my spit to the mix of the paint to thin it down a little bit. Um, and it's a habit I have had since I was a kid. Like literally I've been doing it forever. Uh, I use non-toxic acrylic paints for the most part, but I have had moments where I've tried a new paint line. I remember me and my buddy Christian, um, we were painting uh, confrontation minis and sitting like watching like old wrestling VHS tapes, I think. Uh, years ago now. This has got to be like 10 years ago. And um, we had just started using Vallejo paints. But like we like Vallejo paints were just basically something that was becoming popular in miniature painting uh, as opposed to just in like scale model painting. And we bought a whole bunch of them and we were trying them out painting these confrontation miniatures. And I remember sitting there painting. I liked it and I was like, hey man, did you tongue feel numb? I don't think I'm supposed to be licking the paint breath because <laughs> it had something in it that was like making my whole lower lip numb and my tongue numb. And uh, we learned the lesson that not all paints are non-toxic. <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, that was the reason why. Uh, it's not necessarily the most popular thing. So it's, a, it's a great um, divide. It's like a Star Trek episode about who is, um, who is, who is what color on which side. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm a paintbrush licker. I will not apologize for it. Ben Gay and Rollons asks, <laughs> why it's just getting worse. Um, hey Ash, awesome job on your channel. I was wondering if someone wanted to get into heavy gear, where would I start? I've gone to Nine's website, but I have no idea how to proceed, thanks. Um, actually, the best place to go is to the War Games Vault website, where the current living rulebook for heavy gear is up for free. Um, the 2015 Living Rulebook is a free download. Anybody can go grab it, um, and that'll let you check out all the core rules and give you an idea of how list building works and all that fun stuff uh, gratis. You can just download the PDF and check it out. Uh, that would be my recommendation. Now, the other thing that you want to think about, and actually, I just posted pics of this on my Facebook page uh, last week when you're watching this. It'll be like a day or two ago now for me. Um, is they are currently in the process of putting their plastic production molds together for full styrene plastic uh, gears that'll make all the different variants. So you may wish to hold off instead of investing in um, the current metal models, you can probably get yourself some super sweet new plastic gears relatively soon. Um, so it's a great time to check it out, maybe play in your army list, uh, you can play some proxy games, learn the rules, if you've got some other like mech minis lying around. Because it doesn't use a whole lot of models, like you, you can play the game with like 10 or 15 models um, as like the average game size. Like a 7 or sorry, 150 threat game, which is like the average game size now, is probably about like 15 models. Uh, yeah, and give it a go. And then when the new hotness comes out, go check out their website. They'll have starter sets and stuff available for all the factions. So yeah, the great Canadian miniature company, DreamPod9. Uh, Hanif asks, would you consider doing an AOS narrative campaign? Well, I've been doing some narrative games um, for AOS, which is my... Uh, my, whatchamacallit, my, um, my realm quest stuff, and those have been a ton of fun. And the big problem with narrative campaigns for me, guys, I don't have a staff, like it's just me. So getting someone to do a narrative campaign requires them to come around probably more than once, like we can't just do it in a day. Um, and that means uh, it's less and less likely. Like I do those little mini campaigns, like with Chris and Jay from Lords of War Games and Hobbies. Um, but to do like a full-fledged narrative campaign, it's not exactly in my bailiwick because I'm just a dude. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, and having Age of Sigmar players come down, um, you know, like four or five times regularly enough that there'd be like a, a narrative campaign. That's more mini wargaming thing. Go check out their stuff. They do narrative campaigns. Um, you know, the the big budget stuff like that, you're gonna go see them for. I'm not I'm not a big budget guy. Uh, I I do lots of little indie games as opposed to like you know spending eight thousand dollars on a Garko Market table and and that kind of stuff. So yeah, check them out. They've got all that cool stuff, man. That's that's probably where you'll be able to find it. Do you even Clarence, bro? Asks, hi Ash, how do you hum and summon or handle summoning Age of Sigmar? Most people in my area go by only resummoning casualties. Um, I, honestly, I leave it up to the player I'm playing. Like, I don't care, because I don't play any summoning armies. Um, so I leave it up to however the person I'm playing wants to play it usually, because frankly, 
it, put it this way. A anything really can be open to abuse. Um, and summoning is one of those things like a hot topic in Age of Sigmar because there are ways to abuse it, you know, rules as written. Um, and that really puts some people off. I don't tend to play people that abuse stuff. Like you don't see, I, I don't, I don't, you've really seen very many games of me playing against an abusive army or someone who's taking the rules and sort of bending them to the greatest benefit. So I don't usually have to worry about that stuff, man. I usually just ask before the game starts, hey, how do you want to play this? And they'll tell me how they want to play it and we just play through. As long as we're consistent game to game, like that's fine by me. And I don't mind being, cons like, I don't mind being, because I always tell you guys how we're going to play it. I don't mind it being different every time we play so long as the person I'm playing has a good time. 8-Bit Hit asks, are you excited for the Marvel Miniatures game? Regarding what I would like to see in a miniature game, uh, is it a Nintendo crossover game or a Persona game? Uh, not really, I'm not a capes guy. I've had this conversation with a lot of people because they have they keep asking me about the Batman game. And the problem I have getting into the Batman game is I don't want to play any of the superheroes because I don't care about the superheroes. Um, so like I'm painting all the cops right now, but it's really hard to make an army of cops or a, a gang of cops because all the guys with guns cost like a bajillion dollars. So you have to get like special guys like Alfred or the commissioner or whatever to make it so that you have extra spending capital basically so you can include actual cops and not just like a night watchman with a flashlight as one of your cops, like, which isn't super compelling, you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, like the Marvel Universe game, again, uh, the one thing I'm, I was kind of weirded out by is apparently it's incompatible, like it uses a different dice, or really different dies than the, um, the, the other game, I think it uses D8s as opposed to D12, so I was just like, okay, that's kind of weird. And then, um, yeah, and then like, it's just, I'm not a capes guy, like I'm not a superhero guy. All the comics I like are usually about anti-heroes who have nothing to do with capes. That's why I like like the Punisher and Judge Dredd and stuff like that, like, those guys are just dudes, you know what I mean? But they're dudes on a mission. Um, my One of my favorite actual cape superhero, superhero comics is The Boys, and I don't think they're gonna do a Garth Emmis or Ennis The Boys um, set of miniatures for any of those night model games. Now, if they do, I will be the happiest man on the planet and I will happily play Billy Butcher, Mother's Milk, um, the female, and uh, what's it, the Frenchman, and, and we Huey uh, as my gang. That will be the only gang I will ever play in that game forever. And it probably would be the only game I would ever want to play too, because that would be an amazing gang. Um, but like, you would just win. Like, that would be the problem, is you would just win. But it would be so inappropriate. I don't even know if I can make videos of it, because that whole comic is like the most inappropriate game ever, or thing ever. Guy asks, hey Ash, hypothetical for you, if GW is in dire financial peril and was purchased by Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast, do you think it would be good or bad for the hobby? Um, well, here's the thing. A lot of people don't, don't really know how big companies like that work, and what they usually tend to do is take the path of least resistance towards money. So I think if, if that happened, if a big company like that were to purchase a property like this, probably one of two things would take place. One, they'd, they'd probably um, strip down the, the property to its core components, which means they, they would not manufacture miniatures themselves anymore. They would outsource all the manufacturing to the lowest bidder, probably in a, a country that, that can offer really competitive rates. Um, which means the level of quality that you have <coughs> of the miniatures themselves being cast in Lenten would go away um, and it would be whatever the lowest bidder's quality of miniature is. Um, and then they wouldn't do, they wouldn't do really a lot probably internally. Um, and that means that a lot of the hard work stuff like model kits, um, the, the rules design, like all that stuff <sighs> would probably get like massively simplified and they'd try and put the IP into big box stores. So they would probably turn it into um, toys is, is really what I'm looking at. And that's, I mean, that's neither here nor there. Like if you look at the Wizards of the Coast um, uh, properties, the, the most successful one, obviously D&D and Magic, um, the D&D minis are not, the licensed ones are pretty cool, like the resin ones, but the other ones like for their board games and stuff, they're just board game minis. There's nothing wrong with that, but I think what's, what would happen is you would kind of, you would not be targeting the same customers, right? They're, they're targeting customers that shop at Barnes and Noble um, and want their games in places like Barnes and Noble, whereas GW is trying to create customers out of the ether. You know what I mean? With their own wholly owned retail chain and with all the, the, the in-store marketing and stuff they do. So yeah, I don't, 
I, th I think if you were a current existing GW customer, it would probably not be the greatest thing in the world because it would drastically change the product offer that you would be having. Um, I think if you'd never considered a hot like a hobby like this before, it could be a good thing because it would probably make the game, uh, well, the the, pro the IP more accessible to more people, but it wouldn't be in a form that we would probably recognize today, like like what we have today. So I can't really put a good bad judgment on it because. It, 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 I don't think it would be good, bad. It would probably be good for some, bad for others. It, it would just be really, really different from what we have now. Do, do. Uh, no Name asks, hey Ash, have you ever played, um, considered playing any of the fi Fantasy Flight Warhammer board games for Forbidden Stars, Cast in the Old Worlds for your videos? Um, <clears throat> we've talked about doing board games. I'll be honest, I, board games aren't as compelling for me because there's no miniature component, right? Like I'm a war gamer, I make all this stuff. Um, I was having a conversation actually yesterday with somebody about that, about the difference between how it was actually about YouTube and how I'm not really a YouTuber. <laughs> I know that sounds funny. You're watching this on YouTube, about a guy on YouTube, but I'm not really a YouTuber. I'm a war gamer. Um, I just happen to make videos about war gaming. So I think the difference is, and if I'm going to split that hair is that I would be doing this anyway. I would be sitting, if I wasn't making a video right now, I would still be building these models to play games. I probably wouldn't be playing it in a studio, right? I'd be playing it in my basement or in a gaming store with my friends. But all of this stuff, all the hobbying that I do, um, I would be doing no matter what, whether I was making videos or not. I just happen to also make videos while I'm doing it that you guys seem to enjoy. <laughs> um, so when it comes to board games, unless there's like a really heavy miniature component, I really like the models for it, it's probably not gonna show up on the channel because it's not, it's it's not gonna be compelling to me and it's not really the same market, right? So would I try it out? Probably, like, and board games like um, Execution Force, which is really great, Space Hulk that I love, of course. Um, they just announced the new Warhammer Quest, like stuff like that, you're definitely gonna see on the channel because there's a model component. But as far as like sort of non-miniature board games, probably not. Respondents Kip skipped their name. Hey Ash, I'm gonna miss them, but have you ever gotten around to finishing the models requested by your Kickstarter backers? Loving the channel, keep up the great work. Um, I've done a bunch of them. Um, actually, uh, Realm Quest was designed as the first leg of that. The, the biggest amount of people requested, because at the time, right when I was doing that, the Indiegogo had happened after I left Mini Wargaming, and the primary thing I was making for Mini Wargaming at that point was Warhammer Fantasy videos. So most of the people that, that, that wanted a, a miniature made of themselves wanted Warhammer Fantasy ones. So the biggest stack of them was that. And I've actually gotten through, there's two left to do, and I have a special project for those, which includes three other miniatures. I was <laughs> like, three other Yeah, three other miniatures, um, which actually Owen and I might actually end up playing against each other, uh, which would get Owen to play Age of Sigmar, which is crazy. Um, th those ones are, are done. Sorry, all but two are done. So um, the Founding Forge Fathers, uh, the Four Horsemen, and uh, the Tyrad of all my ogres. That is seven, 11, 14 of the 16 miniatures for that one that are done. It was about 40 models all over. So I'm just under halfway through those. The next leg of them I'm gonna be working on is Infinity Ones. And in fact, in my, uh, you saw one of the Infinity Ones, which was a Toha one assembled. I think there's five or six Infinity Ones and they'll be next because I'm working on some Infinity stuff. And after that it'll be 40K and then like the miscellaneous stuff. So I'm saving because like, Two of them were Blood Bowl minis, and I really want to do them when the new Blood Bowl comes out. As that, thank you. Um, and it's just like a, it, it's a, it's a, it was a huge amount of models. So I kind of broke it into project plans. So the Agency ones are supposed to wrap up, or the Warhammer ones are supposed to wrap up, and they're going to keep having adventures and, and be sort of like in the dock as, as characters going forward. And then I'm going to start working on the Infinity ones next. Because yeah, it's like how do you eat an elephant? It's one, one, one bite at a time. <clears throat> Istvan down by the river. <laughs> It's fun down by the river. That's like a Horus Heresy joke. Uh, Ash, in 40K, it can seem as though some armies consistently receive powerful updates um, while others never seem to get the sale boost. Do you have any insight into the codex creation process? Is it just luck? Um, well, it's certainly not just luck. Uh, it's, it's probably mostly to do with um, the fact that certain lines of miniatures sell better than others. Um, <clears throat> and so to keep people invigorated and interested in that, you will come back to certain lines of miniatures. So Space Marines are a good example. Space Marines are always gonna get cool stuff. Why? <clears throat> people love Space Marines. And it's that simple. Um, and your people aren't wrong when they say that, oh no, look, another Space Marine update. Well, 
if it was the thing that people love the most, why would you not keep giving it to them? And the problem is, um, <laughs> people don't ever say anything usually when they're happy about something. So all the people that love all the Space Marine stuff that comes out, don't typically uh, go online and go, oh, I'm so happy that all the Space Marine stuff come out, came out. But the people that are unhappy that their thing didn't get something new and the Space Marines got something again, will go online and say it. So, so you tend to hear from the unhappy people far more than you hear from all the people that are super excited about it. Um, but let me just tell you, there's gotta be a lot of people super excited about it because if GW keeps doing it, it's because people keep buying it. And it's just that simple. Um, and if you don't like Space Marines, well, you know, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like 40k is, is a lot of space marines a lot of space marine players um all about the booty asks hey ash i'm looking for a pirate mini game specifically one where you have little guys not ships have you played on the seven seas by osprey i have not um the pirate game i played the most there's two pirate games i played like quite a bit of one is cutlass by gab thorpe uh, which is a really neat dice based game so like instead of having stats you have a size of dice. Sorry for my sniffling. This is, it's just like, there's pollen everywhere today. Um, so I'm, I'm getting like the spring fever, I guess. Um, so I've not played on the Seven Seas by Osprey, uh, but Cutlass is about, it's about warbands, right? So it's about pirate warbands. Uh, but they're all fantasy based, so that was super cool. So like you can have pirate dwarves and pirate orcs, pirate goblins, there's a pirate giant, elves, humans, all that stuff. Uh, and then the other one is Legends of the High Seas by GW based on the Lord of the Rings system. And it is fantastic. And it's kind of optional if you have boats or not. Like you do have a boat and some scenarios can use your sloop and your sloop can get better, but the boats are not a hugely integral part. Like you don't have to have the boats. I mean, they're not a huge thing. Uh, there's also this new game, uh, which is in <coughs> crowdfunding right now, that um, I did a little, they shared some some sort of like sneak peek stuff with me, um, and that is Blood and Plunder, uh, but they are all about the boats. So uh, yeah, if you don't want the boats, their, their big selling feature is they are doing plastic boat models. Sullivan asks, do you think the Half-Life universe is a solid setting work for a war game? Um, it's funny because every time someone asks me if there's a, a, a video game universe I would like to see a miniature war game for, I forget about the Half-Life universe because that would be one that I would absolutely love to see a miniature war game of. I love the idea of there being like a human resistance and an alien occupation. Like <clears throat> it is just a fantastic universe. Um, it has like, it's full of characters. There's monsters. You could do a great warband game with people playing like Overwatch um, soldiers or like, like a roving patrol or you could play as like the Lambda uh, resistance fighters. Uh, you could just call it City 17. Like there could just be like a huge, uh, after the explosion of City 17, like a huge like war basically that has all the different factions fighting through it. You have the Zen monsters, uh, even the Combine themselves, like that would be so cool. Ryan asks, hey Ash, uh, it was fun painting Malfoy with you last episode. Do you read comics or graphic novels? Any stand boats? Have you backpacked the West Coast Trail on Vancouver Island? Love all you do. That's like so many questions. <laughs> um, do you read comics or graphic novels? I do. Uh, I just talked about the boys, so I'm gonna let that question stand. <clears throat> have you backpacked the West Coast Trail on Vancouver Island? I have not. Um, Vancouver, it's funny, I've done more in Seattle and Washington than I have in Vancouver. Because when I was working at West, I was actually working mostly in the Western United States, like in the Pacific Northwest, as opposed to my own country. Um, so when I was out in, in Van in BC, I was usually always working and it, it would be like an in and out sort of like quick turnaround trip. Um, and I didn't have a chance to actually get outside and do very much. Um, so I'd love to, I have tons of friends, like I should have at some point in my life because I have tons of friends living out there, but that is one spot I have not managed to get to. Caledonian asks, I want a Dune miniature game. Okay, well, that's still not a question. Do you think the Dune universe would make a good tabletop board game? And if so, how'd you create it? Skirmish, epic scale, blah, blah, blah. Um, yes, I do think it'd be a good miniature game. Um, uh, it, it kind of already exists and it's called Warhammer 40K. <laughs> like, <laughs> because so much of 40K is ripped right from the pages of Dune, um, it's hard to say that that game doesn't kind of already exist. But yeah, no, I think it'd be super cool as a miniature game. Um, and I would totally play the heck out of it. If I was gonna do it though, I think I would do it as a um, big battle game because you only really capture what makes Dune different when you have things like the worms and the thopters and the, the stuff like that. There was a great Dune uh, RTS game. Like one of the very earliest RTS games actually for the computer uh, was Dune 2 and it had all that stuff. Like you had like harvesters, you had, th you had everything, you had thopters. I'd love to see that translated maybe in like 15 mil scale into a war game. 
A happy squalo asks, would Pano Shiannia be broken if they had access to smoke, either zero view or eclipse? What do you think of the choice to keep Pano without warbands or more smoking in three? Um, it's funny because the thing that you get instead of smoke in Pano is like crazy amounts of visor access, like tons of guys with visors. Um, and there's some cool stuff too coming through. Like the Blackfriar kind of has personal zero V smoke, but it's also white noise. Like it's crazy. He's basically the, the visor hunter in the army. Um, there's a variant of him with drop bears and a multi-rifle and like, yeah, he's got the, the personal zero V smoke. So it's not a cloud, it's just like, He's invisible to people in visors, which is bananas. <laughs> um, and he's got that bio detector visor thing too, which is crazy too. Um, I just think it's a balancing thing. Like it's horses for courses, right? And it kind of gives them personality. They don't think they need smoke because they have all this tech that makes smoke basically irrelevant. Um, and there's a guy with the clips. Uh, so there's the there's the one knight, um, the Garda de Assalte with the, the eclipse light grenade launcher. Um, so there's access to some smoke and anybody can take him. Um, he's available in uh, Akon, I think. He's available in, not Neoterra, but he's available in in, um, what's it, the, uh, the, uh, da, 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 the uh, vanilla as well. So I think there's, um, there's sort of like a thematic thing there where they get access to the thing that counter smoke so much that they act like they just don't need smoke. And I think that's kind of neat. I'm down with that. I think that's a cool, that's, it's a cool personality thing. Um, and I don't think they'd be broken because like, they, they already have access to so much good cheap stuff anyway. Having cheap warbands with smoke that are like impetuous or frenzy doesn't really make sense for them. If you want the high tech guys with smoke, just go play Yu Ching. They, they, have, they have the same kind of like shtick, except they do get access to smoke with Quang Shi and with, um, what's it, uh, Shaolin and stuff like that, all having smoke grenade access. So I, I think there's a faction that does that and I don't think they're broken. So <laughs> I think it's, it's pretty much all good. Christine asks, hey Ash, what do you think about the Age of Sigmar? The game has a lot of hate to start off. What do you think of the future of the game it will be and what's its current stage? Um, well, if you haven't seen the announcements about the, the different ways to play, I think that that says it all. Like, I think, that, I think that a big thing about Age of Sigmar was trying to break people's preconceptions that there's a right and wrong way to play a game. And I think that's a really noble endeavor because that's something I really subscribe to myself that that you can just play with your toys, however you wanna play with your toys. And that was a really strong message from the biggest fish in the pond that they thought that was important. Um, and I really, really, really appreciate that. Like, I think that that was an excellent, um, an excellent thing to a very esports minded <coughs> current generation of hobbyists um, that are very used to the, the leisure activities they do all being about ranking people and about how good you are and about winning and losing. Not necessarily about telling a story or using your imagination. So, um, and when I say esports generation, what I mean is um, the, the young people right now whose, whose video games are being designed always to be uh, death matches and first person shooters, you know what I mean? Like, like those, those games, like the calls of, Call of Duties that are out there, they do nothing for me because they, they're just a reset button and then ranking the players and a reset button and then ranking the players. The entire point of it is to be at the top of the ladder at the end of the, the whistle basically, or the end of the match and not at the bottom. And it's just, a, it's just a little shot of ego boost every time you play it. There's no emerging story, uh, you know, people will just sit for hours and be ranked against each other. Even League of Legends, it's about winning and losing. That's it, that's that's all it is. Um, it's, a, it's a ranking system, there's not a lot of, it all, okay, so I'll put it this way. The game is feeding you an ego boost or an ego punch, depending upon how you perform in it, every time you play through the match. But you're putting nothing really into the game. So, so the game is feeding something to you, which is that emotional either high or low, but all you're doing is interacting with the game. You're never changing it. The game is always the same, right? You aren't influencing that world, that, influ that thing at all. So it's coming out to you. You're, it's, it's almost like, it's kind of a, a lazy thinking thing, right? You're, you're being fed the emotional response. You're not injecting the emotional response. Whereas what Games of Crap did with Age of Sigmar, that non-esports mentality is, it, it, it forced you to create the story and the fun and, and the balance and have a conversation with people. And so it was you putting yourself into the process, which is a very, at this point in, in, a, in a world where young people are in their leisure activities, 
not having to contribute a whole bunch to them to make them successful, right? Like a gamer doesn't contribute a lot to the world of League of Legends. They 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 just log in and go, right? They don't they don't have an impact on it. They just have their performance and the evaluation being spit out basically at the end of each match. Um, whereas with Age of Sigmar, you're creating that. So I would say like Age of Sigmar is more like. Um, uh, the, the the free Steam engine made by uh, Valve, where where players got together and, and even individually, they just created all this stuff and they tinkered and they made mods. It's it's like that kind of a sandbox mentality. Uh, and now what they've done too is they've said, but everything is fun and everything is okay, and and we're going to create other ways to play too, um, so that everybody who enjoys playing a certain way can play a certain way. And I think they always intended to do that. I don't think it's a reaction. They they don't plan. Let me push it this way: Games Workshop does not plan in months. They plan in years, um, and that means that this was always the plan. <laughs> they they don't they don't turn the boat fast. <laughs> um, and so I think that giving that first year uh, to, to, to kind of teach people that you can do what you, like you can create your own fun and it's just as valid as being told this is the official way to play or this is the right ranked way to play or you know, this is the competitive way to play. That there's, bo both are equally valid um, and I think that one was being a bit subsumed by the other and I'm very, very appreciative of Games Workshop for taking that kind of strong, bold stance on they're toy soldiers, just have fun with them. And there's not a right way, right or wrong way to do that. And don't, it's it's wrong, I think, to, to make people think there is. Danger Nerd Close, or James, asks, there seems to be a trend for board gaming coffee shops and coffee houses with board games. Could this model work with war games or war game coffee shop <clears throat> or a war game venue with food? Um, I mean, I yes, I guess. <laughs> I think the difference is the setup and teardown time on board games, uh, not all board games, obviously, there's some that are crazy complicated. And war games is very different. Um, and with a food-based mo like model, a sales model based on food, it's all about turnaround. So some war games take an exorbitant amount of time to play, which means you couldn't turn over customers fast enough to really make it viable. So I don't see war gaming as being the best. Honestly, the, the video game board game ones I see as being quite good because as long as the games being provided are like 30 to 45 minute games, that's the average time for a meal usually, a sit down meal. Um, and that means that you can have enough customers come through during a day and buy a meal that your business model is viable. Whereas a war game, it, I think it's considerably more time consuming, even just in the, in the, the, the unpack and pack up stage for people just randomly coming in. Um, for it to probably be viable as a business idea. So I think it's cool. Um, I think it's a cool business idea. But if, if someone, like if I was like, if I was the guy having to, to yes or no that business plan, I'd just be like, I'd be like, there's an inherent problem here. <laughs> like, unless every game is of a certain point size and you only give people a certain dimension table to play on, like a smaller size table. So like, you could have everybody play a, I don't know. I can't even think of a machine that would play that fast. Like even a 35 point game like Malifaux or a 35 point game War Machine, just the setup and the tokens and the cleanup and stuff, you're talking about an hour at least. And that's longer than you want as a meal time for table service and turnaround. Like it's just too long. You want 30 to 45 minutes. Yeah, I think that's like you want, you want as long as it takes to play a game of Carcassonne or to play a game of Settlers of Catan, um, which typically just doesn't take that long. So I don't think it's viable. Shadow Ace 1124 asks, where can I buy those GMG measuring gauges? I would love to buy me some of those. Um, I, I've struggled with this for a while. I've ordered some test ones. I'm, I'm doing a thing with um, the guys at Lords of War where we all did a big order to get some test ones made. I'll have 35 of them available on a first come first serve basis uh, sometime in June for the birthday, for the, for the channel birthday when the channel turns one. Um, and I'll have some that I'll give away as well. Sorry, I'll have, I'm gonna have five I'll give away, I'll have 30 that'll be um, available first come first serve. So we will, uh, we will see then. Stay tuned for more on that. Um, Respondent skipped this question, is there a Mrs. the Cooler? Well, he's got a mom, yeah. <laughs> I know that's not what you mean, but everyone's got a mom. Dan asks, any chance you could do a throwback Thursday on 2nd edition 40K? The rules are almost similar to something like Infinity than Modern 40K. You're right, they were. And yes, I, I actually have a plan. This is part of my, my, my next, well, the year two sort of channel ideas. I've actually been hoarding stuff behind the scenes um, to do some stuff where I do old editions of games. Because I would love to do a series that isn't Throwback Thursday, 
it's gonna happen on Thursdays, but it's almost like an educational series on, on I'm gonna, I, I wanna call it something like when we were young, um, on the way games used to be. Uh, and the first one I'm gonna do, won't be second edition 40K, it's gonna be Rogue Trader, because I have all the things to do the Battle of the Farm from Rogue Trader, like literally the miniatures from the book, everything. And just to show people how different games were when I started playing miniature games to how they are now. And I think that that's really good because that kind of segues back to my discussion about um, the Age of Sigmar thing that I just had, that little sort of like rant I just had. Uh, it, I think it, it lends perspective to just where things have gone and sort of the psychology of, of the way games are being designed even by some companies. So yeah, I think it's gonna be worth doing. Um, and I've got a bunch of games that I wanna do that way too. Mango Juicehead asks, I'm curious, would a fallen Warlord Titan be too restrictive if scattered across a six foot board? I'm working on a train set as I'm inspired by the tables you play on. Keep the good work. I don't think so. Um, I mean, obviously it depends upon how it's laid out. A Warlord Titan's not that big. If it's a six foot board, like if you had like its legs over here and then, you know, arm over, like it, you wouldn't fill up a table <laughs> at all. Um, if you mean an Emperor class Titan, then maybe, because an Emperor class Titan would be like the size of a three year, four foot child. <laughs> like, so them laying on a table in pieces might be a little more restrictive, but I think it's just all about how you lay it out. Like, it wouldn't have to do with um, the size of the actual like model lying down. It would have to do more with the way that you arranged on the table. Alarial's Chosen, what do you think about the upcoming play styles for Age of Sigmar, Match Narrative, et cetera? I think I talked about that earlier. I think it's awesome and just lends to the idea that everybody should be able to play however they want. Sneering Imperialist asks, would you think a Gears of War skirmish game would work? Um, I think it'd be really cool. Missions and lore is incredible. Really interested in your thoughts. Love your channel. Yeah, I think it totally would work. Gears of War is a great um, sort of post-apocalyptic sci-fi setting. Um, and I think that if you went to Reaper's website, you could probably find all the Gears of War minis that you possibly would need to just do it right now. Uh, in fact, you could easily take this as not a test and just play Gears of War with it. Like, done. Like, all the, all the hazards, like the, um, the crazy rain showers, and, or not, it wasn't rain showers, it was the weird flock that couldn't go in the light, like that stuff. You could do all that stuff with this is not a test. Just get the models, that'd be it. Um, and that was actually the last question. I went through the final question. I think we're over an hour now, so that's perfect. So uh, we are done. I'm gonna finish up this last two minis I gotta do, which is two flenses for my St. Mary stuff, and I'll be finished too. So thanks again for watching. Um, if you, again, if you wanna get a question for next month, click the link below in the video description, um, and we will see you for another sit and talk. It should be on time this month, because I shouldn't have anything going on that keeps me from doing it. Um, so it'll be a bit shorter, so get your questions in fast. I'll get an answer. I got through all of them this time, so hopefully people are asking new questions, and we won't repeat anything from this past month. So hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'll see you next time. Till then, I'm Ash. Have a good day.